Welcome to another episode of the Sleep Nanny podcast. So I am here today with Vicky Cooksley. Vicky is one of our amazing franchisees at the Sleep Nanny and she's an absolute specialist when it comes to autism. Um, Vicky has absolutely nailed how to help families when it comes to dealing with the challenges with little one's sleep, but also with the added complexity of autism. So I'm going to introduce you, Vicky, and share a little bit about you know, really what got you into that specialism in the first place. How did you get here? Thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone. I first sort of became interested in autism and sleep, or autism in general, actually. Um, my two young children, who are nine and six, are neurodiverse. They've been um, sort of uh, diagnosed with autism and ADHD. And from that, I guess what you'd say, they, they've inspired me, actually, to sort of delve into that world, look at the science behind sort of autism and ADHD and all the neurodiversity um, and from there, really looking at all the challenges that we've sort of come across and all those hurdles that many families are already aware of, I'm sure it's it's sort of grown from there. My passion with um, sort of being able to help and find solutions, not just for my children, but for other people's children as well. And it started off very much with giving advice and helping out and making suggestions. And from there, it sort of zoned in and really sort of specified and really sort of uh, became sort of more of an expert in, in the sleep aspect of things. Amazing, amazing. And you really are. Um, it's, it's important to have this kind of help because I think people often fear or worry that the, that the, the help with sleep and that kind of support isn't going to work for them because they have got these added complexities and they think, well, yeah, that's all well and good for you know, neural typical children, but it's, it's not going to work for me. I can't be helped. And I love that you're here to say, yes, you can. Yes, there is hope. You just need to take things a little differently. It's a just yeah. different approach, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I can't emphasize that enough, to be honest. It is so many families I work with are lots of them turn around to me and say, I've tried absolutely everything. And I, they're absolutely right. They have tried everything that they've read about and heard about. But what we've got to be mindful of is what they've read about and heard about are very much neurotypical based sleep solutions. Um, yeah. And they don't sort of consider any of the autistic traits and sensory differences and things like that. So of course, it's not going to work for a lot of our children, definitely. And when you think about it, there's basically different chemistry going on in the brain, isn't there? And yeah. so the, the hormone releases are, are different. The, the things that um, you know, one brain experiences are different to how another, what another brain experiences. So Absolutely. we need to take those different approaches. And we take a bespoke approach to helping families with sleep in every case anyway yeah. but it's just another a whole nother layer um to consider and i mean what uh, we'll 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 talk a little bit about how um parents can approach this with autism you know with autism at play but i imagine there are a lot of people who are in that sort of cross zone of um is it autism causing a sleep problem or is it sleep a sleep problem presenting symptoms that look like potentially autism or ADHD, which I think we'll come to that as well, because I know there are lots of people out there probably sat there now without a diagnosis that are curious and that are wondering, you know, does this apply to me or not? Is my child going to need this different approach or not? And I think that the great thing is you know, stick around, listen to Vicky, because she's going to share things with you that will actually help anyway so if you're in doubt then listen up and it's going to help you yeah. so starting off with those where you know they've got a little one they they have got that diagnosis or almost or pretty pretty darn certain mm -hmm. and they're that parent that you said they've tried everything they've listened to everything and they're still stuck why might they still be stuck there are a lot of different reasons and what we've got to be sort of mindful of is lots of children don't get diagnosed until sort of five or older um so yeah. we, we are quite frequently working with families that, that are older children and into their teens as well um, but like you mentioned the the sleep 
sort of methods that I use actually can apply to any child. So it doesn't matter whatsoever if they actually have that diagnosis or not. The methods can work beautifully. Um, and it's it's really making sure that we're meeting your child's needs. And that, that's really fundamental. And it's also looking at the things that we need to consider um, with, yes, possibly, you know, autistic traits, of course, but their sensory differences. There's lots of sensory things going on for every single person, every single child. But it's being sort of that um, sort of really conscious of it and really getting to know your child's sensory differences, as well as their processing needs. Every child processes things differently um, and quite frequently autistic children do need a visual aid alongside verbal communication. Um, quite often, if, if we're working with nonverbal children as well, we need to really consider how to get that message across to them in a really sort of calm environment. The other thing we need to look at is um, bedtime influencing or, or really contributing to meltdowns or shutdowns. And they are quite significant for a lot of autistic children, especially when there's a lot of pressure going on. And another thing just to mention quickly is anxiety. It's quite often linked. Um, a lot of autistic children have got higher anxiety levels. So therefore, we really need to delve into that world as well. It's not just that night, uh, that seven till till seven sleep. We need to look at that 24 hour picture, definitely. Mm. And there's yeah. so many, so many things that influence that that we have to look at. So things that go on during the day, schooling, transitional processing. Um, there's just a whole whole world of things we need to delve into, which is which is a lot more than just sleep. And we look mm -hmm. at that whole 24 hour picture to get that those really great results. It is, isn't it? It's their it's their whole day it's their whole ex routine experience of life from in in 24 really, really hours is. yeah absolutely is, is there anything that you see repeatedly um as a stumbling block where it is a case of a child who has has that autism um or likely has autism in there but uh, yeah something that you see comes up all the time yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. We do quite often what we we do see um, always sleep is, in, uh, is is a thing that gets affected mostly. That's one of the major aspects of um, the struggles that a lot of autistic children face. What we quite often see is things like children. You might have been out with them all day. They we know they should be absolutely exhausted, but in fact, when they go to bed, they are fidgeting. They 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 can't. They're restless. They are scratching the wall. They're tossing and turning, they're, they're in and out their duvet, they're trying to get out of bed. It's like their brains can't switch off. It's like their bodies can't switch off. And that's not necessarily an autistic trait. It's not to say your child is autistic, but we do see things like that quite frequently. We also see a lot of waking nights, um, early risings, uh, anxiety, high anxiety, um, and meltdowns and shutdowns quite often around bedtime and that's usually actually linked not necessarily because they are autistic but actually because of what's happened during the day that build up that um, in those inconsistencies that go on throughout daily living whether they're at nursery or at school or if they're homeschooled there's so many different inconsistencies and that can really, really challenge um, a lot of autistic children with those with the changes. Even small changes can make huge sort of, uh, uh, aftermath, a ripple um, of, of all sorts going on that goes on into the evening. And we quite often see masking during the day, especially if children are at school. And there is a big difference some of the time between um, autistic girls and autistic boys. Um, it's not always the case. It's not black and white, of course, but we do predominantly see quite a lot of masking with autistic girls um, and therefore we kind of get that coke bottle effect with a lot of young people where they get home it's a safe place and they explode that's when you get though that they're over um you know over a sort of sensitive they are they need to decompress basically after school and if we don't allow that to happen then the bedtime is definitely affected in a negative way so we do have to look quite a lot into all the factors that, that will trigger um, a, a negative outcome for bedtime effectively. For bedtime. But yeah, that could be seen in, in multiple different ways. Could that be, is that potentially heightened then when 
there is autism at play because uh, to some extent I'd say you you can see that with neurotypical children yes, anyway yeah. I yeah. get like that myself like yeah. you know when you have you have that kind of I always say it's like they're being brave all day they're sucking it up because mm-hmm. they're you know putting on a front and then especially um in the first few years of school and then yes. they come home, like yeah. you say, a safe place, and that's where they can let their emotions out. And I think we all do that. Exactly. So would yeah. you know, there's an element of that for everyone. So if somebody was listening to this and thought, "Oh my god, well my child does that," I would say, "Well, yeah, most do." Lots but do. Yeah. you're saying well, it would be more frequent, a heightened level, it would be, harder to calm. Yes. Absolutely. And it wouldn't just be the meltdowns or the shutdowns that we're looking at. There are so many other factors coming in there to maybe suggest or get us thinking um, whether, you know, that there may be, our child may or may not be autistic. And there are there are just a huge number of sort of traits to look at. But what we do have to be mindful of and really careful of is that actually autistic traits are in my opinion are, are quite often just humanistic traits there are there are many different traits so i would say if you are or do suspect that your child is autistic um then i would definitely to be fair go and get a referral from your gp onto a P- get a pediatrician involved in that sense um because it is really important that we do understand their needs the one thing that we do know is that it is you know over 80% of autistic children do struggle with sleep so the percentage of children um that are autistic the vast majority will struggle with sleep and that their common reasons are melatonin levels and natural melatonin levels aren't being produced as much as we'd like them to be produced naturally in the system and we've got to remember that melatonin isn't um anything you know to be scared of or not to talk about it's it's an actual hormone we all produce but for a lot of autistic children their natural melatonin levels aren't reaching that level that we would like them to to reach at so they they struggle to fall asleep at night and that's where we see that um frustration with them and they might be going i want to go to sleep but they physically can't and i guess a lot of misconceptions i hear are parents and carers say well my child doesn't need that much sleep yeah. They absolutely do. I promise mm-hmm. you, they need just as much sleep as their peers do. The difference is they are struggling. Their bodies are is struggling basically to switch off, and that can sometimes be down to the natural melatonin levels. The other thing that is quite often affected, if um, with an autistic child and adult, is the circadian rhythm, their natural body clock. And again, if we think about being jet lagged or if we worked nights and then had to sleep during the day and then suddenly our jobs change to a nine to five job, our bodies take a little time to readjust. And that mm. that feeling, especially if you're, you know, imagine you're jet lagged, that feeling of going, oh, I want to sleep during the day, but I have to hold on and, and stay awake till it's, bed, uh, till it's bedtime, that feeling you've got quite often is a frequent feeling for an autistic child if their circadian rhythm is isn't quite where we would like it to be the great Mm. news is there are solutions there are are multiple solutions what's really important though is we get that solution that really meets your child's needs and that's Mm. where that that magic lies that's where Mm. you're going to see those wonderful sort of improvements and you're going to see your child struggling less and less and less for sleep and um, they're going to go down to, to sleep easier. They're going to start sleeping through the night a lot easier. Um, but it is all about meeting your child's needs and getting it really right and spot on for them. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And we'll we'll come in a second to some of those solutions. Um, but just one more kind of thought here on, I'm going to tax you on this one. So if you <laughs> are in a position where you're like, okay, some of this is ringing true. I don't know if I have a child with autism, ADHD, or just a super alert, because we talk about that a lot with neurotypicals. Yeah. We're like, super alert, I've got a super alert. Yeah. And to be honest, I've never even considered that there could be any other diagnosis yeah. needed there. And maybe there is, maybe there isn't. But I, I've always gone, yeah, we've got a super alert here. Yeah. There could be a lot of super alerts out there who, who actually aren't neurodiverse. But, right. yeah. you know, how do we... and to reassure parents you don't need to know necessarily you can still put these things in place but how is there a way to differentiate and say well that could be ADHD or that's more likely an ADHD trait than a autism trait I'm thinking of a a little boy I know who a lot of people would say probably has ADHD but Mm -hmm. they're a 
really similar? Are there any clear differentiators that you can it's, share? It, do you know what? It is really hard as a parent and, um, you know, even a parent caring myself. And my nine-year-old was young, younger. There were so many conflicting people going, oh, of course, of course he's not, not, uh, He's not autistic. You know, he doesn't. He doesn't look autistic. He just <laughs> classics. You get. I would strongly suggest that your, as a parent or carer, your gut instinct says it all, and so it goes a long, long way. I always encourage people to really think about what what's going on. Really use their gut instinct, and actually, we are majority of people on, on you know in this world aren't qualified to diagnose. Of course, they're not. So. If you suspect or even an inkling, you think something's just not quite adding up, something doesn't feel quite right, or you're just not sure, the best thing you can actually do is go to a GP, talk through it or talk through it, all the all the traits that you're seeing, everything that you think might be neurodiverse, talk it through with the GP, and then they will make a, a referral to the paediatrician. That's when you're going to get that, that diagnosis or flip it on its head and go, actually, no, he's not, you know, neurotypical child, we think, just, you know, just just lively or, or whatever's going on. But it's, it's really down to the professionals to, so they know what they're looking for. Um, but really, I think my best advice is go with your gut instinct, because mm. nine times out of 10, it's right. Um, mm. From what I've experienced with other parents and carers and Always go with, you know, what you think. Don't be pushed into what other people say or, or think, because actually you're the expert in your child. Nobody else is. Um, so that's yeah. that's kind of the way I, I recommend for people if they are struggling or they're worried. Always just, you know, first, first rule of thumb is go to the GP. But what I would say is jot down any traits that you might think are possibly neurodiverse or any sort of um, repetition, habits, uh, personality traits, things like that, that you think this is actually different from all of their peers yeah. and take that list with you. And that that's really what I would recommend because they they do know what they're looking for and then they can definitely help you out and put your mind at ease. More, more often than not, parents just want to know one way or the other. So then they know how to help. How to support um, them. Yeah, yeah, and I think absolutely. also looking at the parents and or you know yourself if you're one of those parents, like looking at the you know any any signs of those traits in the parents because more and more research is suggesting hereditary. Um, yeah. You know, there there are lines of yes. of yeah. hereditary. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Where yeah, it it, it is hereditary. So looking at ourselves too, the number of times I've seen a parent talk about their child as potentially neurodiverse. And then I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, they probably get that from you. <laughs> you can sort of see it's it, can't you? Opener. It's a real eye opener. Although you yeah. can't definitely say it is, um, you know, it is passed down. It's, it's all of those. There's no, the scientific evidence and research isn't quite there yet. But if you do look at statistics and through through that kind of research, you speak to families, and I speak to a lot of families, um, that, and they start recognising these traits within themselves. Mm. Um, and it is a real eye opener. It, it really, mm. really is. It's it makes you as a parent understand yourself more as well. It could be a really yeah. positive thing for mm. a lot of parents and carers. Um, so I always say, you know, it doesn't have to be all doom and gloom. It isn't it? Really isn't. There are some wonderful elements to it and actually as a parent myself it's it's allowed me to explore so many different avenues yeah. um, and become an expert in sort of autism because of the inspiration of my child and it, it's it's just yeah it's amazing it's an amazing journey to go on mm. it's it's tough it's a bit like a roller coaster from day to day but there are some wonderful aspects and actually the one thing that you do kind of want to nail the, you know, is the sleep aspect of things yeah, because once sure. you've got sleep, it does make things easier. You can just deal with those those daily you know ups and downs so much yeah. stronger. I see so many families struggle, um, yeah. and it's it's purely based on lack of sleep, and it's it's hard mm. to watch, especially mm. when there are solutions out there. And there's there are so many families that like we mentioned earlier, who feel really defeated. And it is because that information just isn't out there yet. It's, yeah. it's just not, it's too generic, the information that, that's sort of given across. 
yeah. and even these generic autism courses are are quite generic so yeah. it's 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 really sort of a journey that you go on as a family and, and explore and there it, there's always an element of trial and error with anything mm-hmm. um but you you do on that journey you do really get to know your child and and their needs and their traits whether they are autistic traits or just human traits it, it's almost irrelevant um it's all about getting to really know how your child works and and how they process things and how they you know if they need to decompress and and things like that and putting solutions in place in order to help I think yeah and I think it's really also reassuring you touched on it there how it's not doom and gloom it's not bad no one's broken like our brains are all wired differently and whilst the you know we'll say neurotypical neurodiverse actually I think it's all just different and if you understand that well when we have this sort of wiring of the brain and the chemistry works like this these things are most like you know these are going to be more prevalent um Mm. Uh, you know, responses. And if we can understand that and tune into that, then we can work with them and support that. And same for adults. And, you know, I don't know if all our listeners would know this or not, but I was diagnosed with ADHD after I just turned 41. So I was 40 when I figured out that that was obvious and and I hadn't known until then. Um, And now I can understand why certain things feel challenging but what to do to make them easier but at the same time I've I've become very aware of the super strengths and you know there are so many superpowers to having these different wirings of the brain that's why we need different people different personalities and sometimes there'll be a personality trait that's very similar to a trait where the brain and the chemistry is different. You know, I, I yeah. as someone with ADHD, yeah. I know that I process dopamine faster than somebody who doesn't have ADHD. Like it's just going, oh, okay, that's why this happens or that's yeah. why, um, yeah. you know, um, and people's coping strategies are different, you know, with yeah, ADHD and chaos. Yeah. Like some people are very messy. For me, I need order so that I'm not distracted by chaos we you know it's you start making sense of the world and luckily sleep's never been an issue for me um but that's why like you I'm so passionate about Mm -hmm. making sure that that one thing that's at the bottom of the pyramid of everything in life that sleep right there with air food and water is (laughs) good because everything else will stack on top of that and all those challenges that you've mentioned with sometimes with children as well regulating emotions social Mm. aspects all these things will be easier if they've got that sleep foundation in place so. so let's talk about that a little bit like what are some of the key things that we can uh think about when we're supporting a you know, autistic, ADHD, or super alert child, because it, it's not going to hurt if you are something going, oh my gosh, I don't know, but I'm definitely, something's resonating. And I know yeah. that my child's not just like everyone and they, I need something different. You know, yeah. what what could we um, start with? There's there's a few things to sort of get your head around, really, and start thinking around, you know, thinking about. And one of the main things for um, a lot of children is sort of that anxiety and that not not necessarily anxiety as such. I know when we say anxiety, people start panicking, but it's not anxiety as in, you know, um, might not be social anxiety, might not even be separation anxiety, but it's all those things that go on, all that build up during the school day or, or during nursery. And if our children do or are struggling with um, sensory differences for example nursery or school have been particularly busy loud lots have been going on um lots of directions lots of sort of um demands on our children then we really need to be considerate of when they come home at the end of the day um demand avoidance is is again something that any child we can work on as parent carers for any child we really can so what I always suggest to families is when our children come home from nursery or school, allow them to have 20 minutes, half an hour of decompression time. And that can be in the form of anything that they can really enjoy doing. That can be a snack. It can be reading a book. It could be doing a puzzle. It could be playing a game. It could be watching their favorite episode on TV. 
doesn't matter what it is. This is a tool that we're going to use in order to allow them to decompress and process all those those daily sort of things that have been going on. What we I'm I'm guilty of it. When I pick up my kids, the first thing I do is go, "Oh, how was your day? Who did you play with? What did you have for lunch?" And already within five seconds, I've already given them five questions. And that if they're already sort of at this this higher heightened state, they're going to see that as a demand. Like, oh, I have to answer. Mum's asking me these questions. If I don't answer, I might get in trouble. And there's a million things going around in their brain already. And then we're just adding to that load the minute they get picked up. So I always recommend to, to people to step back, allow them to come to you and let them talk to you about their day. Try and avoid, and I, I am guilty of it still sometimes. I, I tell myself to stop it, but it's really hard because you want to know how, how your kids, de- you know, how they've gone. But try and hold off. Try less is more in this case. Less verbal mm. communication is actually really, really helpful, really useful for any child at this point, a pickup point. And have something ready for them when they get home. Have that snack, have that game, have that um, tablet with whatever pro- their favorite program is. Have the book ready or whatever it is that your child can really just absorb into. And during that 20 minutes, try not to talk at them, don't ask them any questions. Just let them decompress. Just give them that mm. 20 minutes of chill time. And mm. the difference, and that's just one sort of little um, thing to I would implement immediately if you can. It's just one other thing that we can do to help our children really one transition from school mm. to home or, or nursery to home, or even if you've just gone out for the day home, and it allows them to really decompress and, and process without that interruption all that other noise that's going on chances are they haven't had that the all day there's lots of interfering noise so if we can provide that for them we can help regulate their emotions externally and and young children regardless of of autism adhd or or not actually a lot of young children do struggle of course to regulate their emotions that's an age thing that's not a an autistic trait that's just an age thing and we are kind of responsible then to help regulate them as an external person. And that's just one way we can do that to help. And it really yeah. does make a difference. Question on that. If they are of an age where they like, and I, I know this probably does lean more towards boys than girls, but that they like gaming yeah. and that they would say that that's their thing that relaxes them, that, you know, we all know they can get a bit hyped up playing oh. and it's all, you know, it, <laughs> gaming can be literally like that getting very hyped up on yes but that's their thing and that's what they like to do how do you navigate that as a parent do you do you allow a bit of that because that's their release or are we trying to to take them out out of that level of hype hype like yeah it it really depends on the individual child or, or young person very much so it all depends on how they respond to these gaming so for example you might find young people who do use that and it is a tool it's not um a luxury for a lot of our children um you know it's it's not something that they're they're just oh this is amazing this is a tool for them to decompress which is essential what we need to do there is a fine line in between um allowing them to decompress and then actually then them becoming overstimulated so Mm. i would observe your child to be fair i would have a look over the next few days if this it sounds like your child watch them watch their body language Mm. Are they getting overstimulated? Are they getting hyped up? And Mm. if so, we're not going to take that away from them because that that wouldn't be fair in itself. But we are going to structure it in the right time of the day. So Mm. therefore, we're going to avoid doing that and give them an alternative um, in the evening or later in the evening. Because if they are hyped up and shouting at the the screen and getting all hyped up, they are going to be overstimulated before bedtime. That's Mm. going to be counterproductive. So that's why we always put this kind of um, activity in, I would say straight after school or straight after nursery, because that gives them that time to decompress. It gives them that time to really process and just zone out. But then they've got plenty of time to really kind of calm down afterwards. Mm -hmm. Um, Again, it's very individual. So it might, it, it might be their thing, and that might be a more of a social thing. It might not actually allow them to decompress 
So again, mm. just really watch how your child regulates. Um, Cause you know, child, I say child, it could be a teenager as well. Watch, uh, sort of observe the effect this game has on them, but yeah. don't take it out hundred percent because that is it probably their thing, but yeah. we need to navigate the right time in the day um, mm. for it to be implemented. And it, it's a bit of, you know, tweaking and watching how they respond. And we can always, you know, give them alternative and, and reduce those um, hours or those timings gradually if that suits your child better, um, which normally it does. Going cold turkey doesn't normally work particularly well for a lot of children. It creates um, so more there anger and <laughs> frustration. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. I think, you know, you've made me think a little bit here about actually as parents quite often we'll go um okay you come home from school but you need to do your homework and then you get your game but that's like you're saying again they're like hang on overload demand I need to decompress and perhaps have that 20 minutes and decompress then look at the homework absolutely and it seems counterproductive as a parent we think homework done then you can have your thing but actually flipping it is giving them a sensory break is crucial absolutely and that that's regardless of autism diagnosis or not giving Mm. people in general a sensory break because we all have sensory needs every single person on this planet has sensory needs and allowing them to have that break is actually really crucial for a lot of children obviously there will be some children who want to get it out the way and that is their mode they're in and and that's that's how they're focused absolutely we're working with your children's needs not against Mm. them so if your child is one to want to just get out of the way because that's like an extension of their school day brilliant Mm. work with it then give them the sensory break that that 20 minutes afterwards but for the vast majority of children they are going to need that break that that sort of tap out and and decompression time before they can re-establish and really focus on something else and again, the quality of work is going to be so much better as well, implementing that before they do their homework. So possibly they'll have eaten as well. And yeah. those kinds of things that all help our help our focus and function. Absolutely. Yeah. Amazing. There's, so, yeah, there's lots of little tactics to be putting in place because yeah. I guarantee you things like it's all domino effect. It all it all circles around because we might be thinking, OK, well, how does that affect the sleep? absolutely assure you it really it's all interlinked and it all if one thing isn't lined up particularly well then it's going to always affect that at nighttime sleep uh, in one way or another so lining up this in a and getting it right as often as you can really does have a positive impact on sleep are there anything on that in the morning like starting the day type things that are beneficial or hindering so you know as to how they begin the day yeah absolutely so I always recommend a low demand approach and this is not um people you know sometimes think okay well well is this a parenting technique they want to approach but actually it works really well and I always introduce to people I work with my my smart choices and this is this is something I've sort of created and it works really really well a smart choice is something that you offer to our your child your child or your teenager when you don't mind which one they pick so for example in the day especially if you're saying to your your child just get your shoes on we're going and they're literally doing everything apart from getting their shoes on that I just got to get my lunch I just got to get this I just got to do this or they're running out you know up the stairs again and it leaves parents frustrated, angry. It really creates this really sort of negative um, start to the day and really quite stressful. So I always say introduce smart choices. There's lots of psychology behind this. Um, so I won't go into to too much detail because we'll be here all day. But if you give them two choices that you don't mind the answer to. So, for example, do you want to put your shoes on now or your co- oh, do you want to put your shoes on or your coat on first? The demand's gone. They've got a choice that empowers them. They feel in control. And that's another thing that we, again, is an age thing, but also very much an autistic um, thing where autistic children really thrive on feeling in control. Again, a lot of young children do regardless. And this is where they come into their element. If we allow them to have this controlled element of control, so they feel like they're in control, but actually we are still Um, by giving them these smart choices it changes things the dynamics massively and if you can introduce that sort of during the day and into the evening and not just as a one-off it really changes things a lot for the better it it can work um wonders it really really can I love that I I, 
Yeah, I don't like. Um, I like being in control, <laughs> and I, yeah, and I, I, you know, I can I see that most of us do. Yeah, even that in adulthood of yeah. just, yeah, that's it's, children. Yeah, that's they're they're different. They thrive when they've got that, but it's all about the psychology behind it, I guess, and it's all about make. They feel like they, they're, you know, they've got this control. They've got this choice. But actually, we don't mind which one they pick. (laughs) And like you say, it relieves that demand. That's the thing, isn't it? It's when you've got that sense of too many demands or... Yeah, um, overwhelming. And you're not going to get a a good result. You're going to get a shutdown or a meltdown. And meltdowns, as we know, aren't behavioural. It looks like they're behavioural to anybody walking past. But actually, a meltdown and shutdown is is gone way beyond that for for autistic children. And it's, it's, it's... really really hard it's where their their needs are not being met and they've got to such a point that they just cannot you know they can't cope anymore and if we're seeing that on a daily basis then that's going to have a huge impact on on their sleep at night time and that's where these smart choices can really help alleviate some of these um getting basically getting to that point where they have a meltdown so it's it's really really good there's lots of different ways you can incorporate smart choices into daily routine yeah so in summary then I'm and I love how listening to you you know you can see how you can apply this to any child so you don't need that diagnosis to get started to get you know it's not you're not going to do any harm if anything you know take this approach if in doubt take this approach and you'll be okay and you need to look at the whole 24 hours you need to look at how you start the day how you end the day what demand you're putting on them how they're you know potentially feeling and processing things and all this is going to contribute to to good sleep um are there any kind of last sort of tips as it were tip bits that like when it comes to sleep if you know if you're there going yeah I've definitely got a child who's finds it very hard to shut down they've got a busy brain they you know they are like fidgety struggle to settle waking in the night or early rising you know those classic 5 a.m wake ups yeah. and they're wired and ready to start the day and we know that we need to start looking at that full 24 hour routine but just in the moment like nighttime twilight yeah. hour what can a parent do just as an easy win to just start on the path um now before obviously they get in touch with you for more help <laughs> um i think the biggest thing to do if i'm honest is do less observe your child it is so so important that we or you know you start understanding your child's needs of course you understand them um to a point but really delve in watch their body language less verbalization less verbal communication um, really, really helps. Less demands, definitely. I think actually one of the biggest things we can do is lower those those demands and introduce those smart choices. Um, I know it's frustrating. I, I've been there myself. Um, it, it's incredibly frustration, uh, frustrating when your child is struggling to fall asleep. But we need to remember, I always say re- education, it, it, the more educated you are up on, on melatonin and circadian rhythm and autistic traits and you know and things like that the more you understand the reasons behind what, why your child's doing what they're doing yeah. and the more you understand that the more you can get to grips with it and really understand what's going on and therefore you can get, create those, those solutions that actually meet your child's needs so I guess the biggest advice really is to start exploring and be a bit of an investigator really and start exploring your child's traits their personality traits I don't just mean you know if, if they may or may not be autistic traits but their personality traits look at their sensory needs check the the bedroom is set up to you know make sure it's comfortable for them um not for you because we as parents will set up our children's bedrooms and then go oh doesn't this look nice actually we haven't looked at what they want in their bedroom or the way the bedding is or the fabrics of the bed or if the pillows on the right side we have, we tend to just do what we think looks nice. And so really do some investigation work with your child, include them in it, whether it's, you know, a young child, an older child or a teenager, get involved yeah. with them and, and just observe them and see how, you know, if you do ask them a question at seven o'clock at night or tell them, right, go to bed, just watch their response, see how they respond, because that is a demand. And if they are not responding well to that, then maybe think about introducing those smart choices Mm. look it's it's eight o'clock do you want to go to bed now or in five minutes 
Mm. We don't yeah, really mind ones five more minutes. Mm. So it's it's things like that to start introducing, and you could do that tonight. Yeah, I love that. That's oh, that's amazing. I could talk about this all day with you. I'm all, <laughs> my mind is going like, hmm, what about this? And what about that? But we do Please have not. to wrap up. There's so much to talk about. Um, I think, you know, I'm sure there will be people listening who have, like me, got lots of questions bubbling up and would love to reach out to you, Vicky, um, which you know, want to invite them to do. How can people best connect with you if they have got more questions on this? Sure. The best thing to do is either email me at vcsleep at gmail.com or you can pop onto my website there is a lot of information on there and find out a bit more about me and that's www.vcsleepconsultancy.co.uk amazing we'll put the link in the show notes as well Absolutely. so they can find you and um yeah amazing well thank you so so much for coming and talking with us about this today uh, it's thank been fascinating and I'm, I'm sure that we'll have you back to delve deeper and do a part two at some point because so I'm much to talk about <laughs> yeah so much to delve into <laughs> and so on yeah definitely thanks so Lovely. much Vicky. thank you very much